fulfill their finances and their game. All salaries in France, over a million euros a year, will be taxed at 75%. Football clubs say they'll have to let go of their best players in order to balance their books. So is socialism going to kill French football? We'll ask that question to our guests. We'll also ask that question to James Creedon, who's got our Media Watch segment uh, evening. this evening. Good Cereal. evening. What's the internet, what's social media saying about this? All right, well, lots of people um, pointing out that the French public generally aren't really supporting the footballers on this one. It's a case of, you know, you've got to take the hit like the rest of us. There was an opinion way uh, poll conducted on Wednesday, Cyril, which said that 67% of French people think the players should pay up. Mm -hmm. So uh, what would, I suppose, strike many as quite a French attitude when it comes to uh, the wealthy. And um, so a lot of people uh, pointing to this uh, front page as well of the satirical Newsweekly, Charlie Hebdo. Zlatan. That, that is a rather unflattering portrayal of Zlatan there. The striker uh, for Paris Saint-Germain. Who the poor guy hand out begging and seeming a little bit hungry and somebody saying you want one or two one or two euros one or two million is it so clearly not a lot of compassion there for Zlatan other people um, I mean even uh, they keep this I thought that was their editorial for a second which I was a bit uh, surprised by but uh, it's just a report in the sports newspaper and they're pointing out that uh, the state is utterly unflexible un inflexible on this one um, advisor to Nicola or two François Hollande quoted as saying, no one is sobbing over the immense poverty of football, of football clubs. Ha ha. So elsewhere, we've got, uh, this is a tweet uh, that I found as well, which is rather funny. Somebody pulling out. Um, a is that quite, François Hollande playing football? That's François Hollande playing football. So perhaps it's something to do with his very awkward football style. And I think he's got good technique. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's revenge. In any case, why do they always do that just before elections as well? Uh, that was a tweet going back a couple of days, which I think is very representative of the tone of a lot of uh, the comments on social media serial. This person here is saying, what are we going to see now? A, a go slow protest with Ferraris and Porsches uh, to block the streets, uh, you know, in terms of blocking that tax. Which brings me to the next point, which is they're highly unlikely, obviously, to stand down on this uh, tax, seeing as in the past two weeks um, there have been two about turns by the French government uh, on tax issues. This shows Breton uh, people protesting in red caps over the eco tax, which was uh, mainly going to hit truckers. And seeing as Brittany is very far west of Paris, they, they would have been worse hit than other regions. So that was already giving, uh, you know, seeing uh, that already gave rise to a lot of headlines saying the government is, you know, not sticking to its guns, etc. Protests on Saturday, which forced the government to backtrack. That's right. So I think highly unlikely, especially when the public supports Francois Hollande for once on a policy issue that he's going to turn down or turn around or do an about turn on the footballers and their tax bill. All right, James Creedon <laughs> with Media Watch. Thank you very Thanks, much. Uh, let's get more on this with our panel this evening. Is socialism going to kill French football? Dan Levy is our France 24 sports editor. He's with us this evening. Thanks a lot, Dan. Erwan Lenon is a tax lawyer and business consultant. And Elisabeth Moutet is a columnist at the Sunday Telegraph. And Pascal Perry is an economist, football fan, uh, has been writing about this uh, intensively and especially about economic models of European football. Let's, let, let's get to that. Um, first off, though, what is your favorite French team? Uh, well, I'm supporting Saint-Étienne because Saint-Étienne is part of my youth. I'm, I'm 50 years old, so uh, well, I live there. Famous yeah, French football yeah, club, yeah, not, not that well, good anymore, as I understand they it. They are belonging to my culture, you know. They are in my imagination. Uh, before we get to the European models, let's uh, let's just take a look at how this 75% super tax came about. Let's look at a quick timeline. François Hollande uh, first floated the idea uh, during his uh, electoral campaign in February 2012. Uh, just a month later, French football officials warned that it might be the death of French football. In fact, the Constitutional Council, after François Hollande became president, uh, cancelled the tax, saying it was illegal. It, was, um, uh, it ran counter to the French Constitution. So the tax was revised. A new project was put to the floor of the parliament. Uh, and that's when it was decided that companies, not uh, employees, would have to pay the tax which has led to the situation we know now with French clubs saying they're going on strike at the end of this month, day 15 of the Ligue 1 games. That's about uh, a dozen games are going to be cancelled. Let's compare the way French football works with perhaps the uh, various European models. Uh, Dan, you were saying there's been wage inflation, especially in the uh, English Premier League. Yeah, well, there are basically um, three ways that clubs make money generally. Uh, they make it either through TV revenue, 
through the kind of footballing means, which is merchandising and, and player sales and things like that. Uh, and also as well, uh, you know, they can make it specifically from a very, very wealthy benefactor as well. And that is the case with Paris Saint-Germain. It's the case of Monaco, who of course are exempt uh, from these taxes. Uh, but the problem is, is that if you have wealthy benefactors coming into football, which has happened recently with seemingly bottomless pockets, um, they tend to drag up the average wage level, and that has happened most specifically sort of in the last decade. So wages have gone up enormously. Uh, you know, the, the, the way that football is viewed has gone up in, you know, in terms of across the world, in terms of television ownership, uh, viewership rather, has gone up hugely. And, uh, you know, the other way that clubs do make money as well is part of that football revenue is, is their match day revenue, yep. which is what they make at the stadium, people coming to buy tickets, etc., etc. Now, TV money is by far and away the, the largest growing uh, of those three, you know, the one that's, that's in bringing you more and more money and in the future will be basically the, the very much the backbone on which club revenue is built upon. Now, the problem for France is, is that French football is not that well uh, regarded around the world. Why are you smiling when you say that? Uh, because, uh, <laughs> because it's the foreign rights for Ligue 1, the foreign television rights, are sold for a pittance compared to the English League. Uh, and that's actually true of most of the other leagues. I mean, Spanish League does quite well, but the, for example, the, the English Premier League the most recent deal, the foreign TV rights, uh, went for 800 million euros a year. French one, 32 million a year. So it shows you ah. the difference so in some... the desire to watch that league around the world. And TV revenue and the difference is set in to the go revenue up and up and up. Football. Exactly, and that trickles down. And for the domestic rights, it's about 1.3 billion per year in the UK, or in the English Premier League, and 610 right. for French Ligue 1. So the amount of money that they can count on, the English clubs compared to the French, is enormous. And if on top of that, they're paying a lot less tax for their players, <coughs> it's going to be much, much easier for them to attract the top players, and many of the top players are French. Uh, let's see how much uh, French players uh, earn on average. Well, I shouldn't say French players. Players playing for French clubs in the Liga earn on average 45,000 euros a month. So uh, that makes it about half a million euros a year. That's and Dan was just uh, talking about the English Premier League. It's probably about 120,000. They earn about four times more, more than I mean, that. Probably, yeah, that figure I've seen was recent. Oh, they got 100. Yeah. 15. So it's it's you know it's it's considerably more in England, and that's not a surprise because the clubs have more money. They they charge more for their tickets, but they you know they're able to charge more for the tickets because it's it's a more highly sought after and and greatly desired product. And they're not and they're also not paying a 75 percent tax. Um, so. uh, uh, what what said you colleague about the TV rights is very interesting. Uh, when you look the uh, amount of money. You, you see that the last of the championship of the Premier League mm. making more money with the TV rights than the first, than the French champion Much with TV rights. And the question today is to improve the match day revenue. I mean, the worst team in the English Premier yeah. League worst, makes more money than the, the last best team one. in the yeah. French yeah. League. Not, not the worst. In the new deal, <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the, the team that wins the English Premier League is set to make around 100 million pounds, so 120 okay. million euros, say. And the bottom team would earn about 60 million pounds, so around 70 million euros. And... Um, that is more. Not the kind of figures. Yeah, you know, if you come bottom in the league, you get 70 million euros. That's a lot of money. But if we compare national Europe, national football systems within Europe, surely um, France has gained. I'm assuming Fr French football has gained in. Uh, uh, it's more attractive to international viewers now that it's got a little bit more right. than a touch of glamour and, with and the new this, players this at is Paris Saint-Germain. Precisely the point is that actually um, clubs like that making it much more difficult for the other teams, PSG and Monaco, make it far more difficult for teams like Marseille and Lille and Lyon, who have more, uh, you know, bunny ears, uh, more organic revenue streams. You know, they have to rely on whether they can appeal to fans, whether they can market their product, etc. cetera, um, whereas PSG can rely on other sources of money. Uh, so they make it much more difficult for the other teams. They make, therefore, the league much less competitive, which should, in theory, render it a less appealing product. However... The only reason that people abroad are going to watch the French League, it has to be said, really, is to watch players like Zlatan Ibrahimovic and David Beckham <coughs> and, you know, Falcao. And uh, the only way that they come in is through the wealthy benefactors. It's interesting. Dan, looking at football as, as, a, as a product that international audiences will want to watch. It's an industry. It's, it's an a industry. real industry. Yeah, it has to be considered as an industry. So and how do you make football more attractive to international audiences? Well, uh, it's getting better with the French football and with the Paris Saint-Germain. But the question for us in France is that we're going to have a two-speed championship. Mm -hmm. On the one side, Paris and Monaco with a special uh, fiscal status, and the other ones. So, you know, today, the, the, what I call the mid-class is going to be hit by this uh, wealth tax, and uh, that's, that's 
going to make yeah, a real two-speed championship. Yeah, it's a question yeah, of competitiveness mm -hmm. in terms of economy, mm -hmm. but also in terms of sport. Listen to what one of our uh, viewers is saying uh, on Twitter. He's saying, say goodbye to any football star. Who would want to pay, stay play in France with a 75% yeah. tax rate? Which well, is exactly That's a good question. Well, uh, the point I is that somebody who could play for PSG or Monaco. Yeah, but, but but otherwise, probably nobody. These yeah. taxes is a sign is a sign to the professional, uh, you know, players. Don't come to France. But we were talking about David Beckham, and David Beckham played for a bit for Paris Saint Germain. It was very much to garner publicity of Paris Saint Germain, and his agreement with Paris Saint Germain was that he would play for five months and twenty eight days. That way, he was not <laughs> six months in France, and he did not become liable to pay tax in yeah, France. <laughs> Uh, uh, David, his wife never moved. Away as well David Beckham is such a, is such an attractive and powerful global brand that I, I believe Dan, correct me if I'm mistaken, that Spain had a tax system for a number of years that was actually called the Beckham tax system. Wasn't yeah, it was known yeah. as the Beckham law, which was uh, which was the I think it was 22 percent something in the 20s uh, that uh, basically foreign players would would only pay a 20 something percent. Uh, income tax, and that would allow them to recruit players like Beckham uh, without paying enormous amounts. It's recently lapsed, I believe, so they're back to sort of 45, 46%. <coughs> and that's meant that clubs like Real Madrid have suddenly have to pay a lot, lot more to, to pay their players like Cristiano Ronaldo, who's earning huge amounts of money. Uh, the benefit for Real Madrid is that they can count on, can count on huge revenue from TV and merchandising, because they are one of the very, very few shining lights at the top of the game who can pretty much make uh, the kind of money they need. So from, from a competitiveness standpoint, you have to bring in the good players, uh, which means you have to be competitive uh, from, from a fiscal standpoint, uh, and that's just not going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. You know what's interesting in what we say is that uh, when Professor Perry says that um, all the, the football clubs are just companies like, and businesses like others, it's true. If you, t if you just look at the football business and other businesses, it's the same structure. We have Monaco and Paris Saint-Germain, like we have the CAC 40 companies, which are the biggest ones that are not Listed on the French stock exchange. Yeah, and sorry. And that, and that are not scared by the ta that are somehow scared by the taxes, but still have the means to avoid them. Some are leaving the countries, but they have uh, lawyers, tax lawyers. They have many people working for them. Then you have the small companies that cannot be become uh, bigger because because of taxes, and it's, it's the same in the in. Um, in the football industry, we have the two stars, Monaco and Paris Saint-Germain, and all the medium companies that cannot grow because of, because of taxes, because of um, corporate law, because of you know, labor law. It's a whole, whole thing that is, going, that is penalizing our, our, um, our companies as a, as a whole in France. But I just wanted to come back on, the, on, the, on James' inter intervention and uh, on, the, on, the tweet, on what we, we read in the press and the newspapers these days. You know, there's a question, is, has, uh, as Mrs. Moutet said, is why do the French hate the rich people? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, we have François Hollande uh, speaking, uh, saying that he hates people who earn more than 4,000 euros a month. We have we had uh, well, he didn't use quite that strong a word, but yes, he did. He did say he didn't I like, the, like rich. the rich. He did say he didn't like the rich. I That's ate right. money. And I, this yes. is what he you know, said. It's very strong for a French pre candidate to say something like this. It's That's and for the business uh, world out and business uh, companies and business investors outside of France, it's very you know they they just open the Wall Street Journal and read. I hate the I hate finance. I don't like the rich. Oh, but hold on, he, he is representing uh, a view that does exist in France. Listen to what one of our viewers is saying. His uh, uh, name on Twitter is Radical Justice 2, and his tweet, <laughs> it's not about money. Hold on, it's not about money, it's about justice. Exactly. Which gets well, they, what, as I said before, the, the, the football players are good tax payers. They pay a lot of freights and the taxes. The players, we understand. Yeah. This is the clubs. Yeah, but the clubs well, also. The clubs. Also, yeah. the all contribution the half, yeah. of all professional clubs is more than 600 million euros a year for, for the national treasury. And what is going to happen is following. You know, you might have heard of the Laffaire curve, uh, saying that tax, too much tax kill taxes. And what is going to happen is that the good players are going to play outside France and the money will not come to that, France. That, 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 I think, to, I think what, the, what our viewer was saying, because it's an opinion we're not hearing very much uh, on this panel, is that uh, France is in dire economic straits, that 50% uh, of the French 
um, population earns under 1,700 euros a month. That's the median salary. And do not pay salary. tax. And, no. and do not pay tax. Income tax. They uh, pay income indirect tax. taxes, but they um, do not pay tax. And, and the tax. point that also politicians across the board, not just the socialists, also the center-right, the, okay. the opposition UMP party, have been saying is that in situations like this one, when we have to address the economy, we're going to ask for more solidarity. That's the word politicians are using on behalf of the businesses. But yeah, you know, justice and solidarity are very nice words for envy. You have to realize that France is a country that was long a Catholic country, and it's also a country that has never uh, uh, decided that Marxism was a bad thing. So you mix the two, and that's what you get. Because these are not efficient taxes. If you look at Germany, Germany in 2010 uh, raised the VAT uh, um, uh, rate by 1%. And quite honestly, if you look at prices in supermarkets, raising the VAT by 1% doesn't much change that. But it worked, but it was, it was across the board. So what we're doing is we're doing a series of taxes that uh, hurt uh, some categories because they are the object of envy for the rest. It is not efficient. It is not making money for the Treasury. It is not pushing the economy forward. So it's really the politics of envy. I think if French players are earning lots of money, then it's right that they contribute a lot of money to the tax system. Um, but the question is, will it hurt French football to increase the amount that they're contributing or that the clubs are contributing? And the, the answer is yes. Uh, but, you know, I mean, that, that's a problem for all French businesses. And, and surprise, other businesses too will be hurt by that. Mm. It's uh, not just football. is no different uh, in, my regard, in my view. I th sorry, but I think the question is even wider. It's, as you said, why do the French want the rich to pay so much taxes? I think that, you know, we'll... We live with, and that's what President Hollande said, we live with the idea in France that there's a level of income that can never be justified. So even if you are very good, it's not justified that you earn that money. So what we do is we decide to pass laws that are going to say you cannot earn more than one million or something. The, why? I, th I think that we live in a frozen society. So if you are at the bottom of the society, you know that you will never go up. It's impossible. This uh, labor market doesn't work. School doesn't work. So what you do is you say, okay, I'm no, I'm never going to become rich. So I'm not going to let the others become rich. I, I think there's something else that's feeding into this, perhaps, which is uh, specific to football. Uh, no longer necessarily feeds into the general French culture and, and and French attitudes towards money, but French attitudes towards their national squad, which is something we should mention. Uh, French um, uh, players who play for the French national team have actually had a very bad image over the last two years. Uh, let's perhaps look at some of the pictures and the reason why they've had such a bad image. Uh, dating back to 2010, the World Cup in South Africa. Uh, that, that bus is actually um, uh, a picture that, uh, Dan, what is that? It's a picture that the, the this French is, This is absolutely public indelibly engraved in the hate. collective consciousness of, of French football. Yeah, this is the, um, the 2010 Nice Night incident where the French players uh, refused to come off uh, the team bus and train uh, in protest, uh, basically, uh, Nicolas Anelka being sent home after what happened in the in the dressing room well, insulting the, the game. yeah the yes. coach the coach and uh, yeah. and you know this this has had a huge impact on french football there's no doubt about it with the World Cup qualifiers coming up in November. And we saw Patrice Evra, who was the captain at the time, recently speaking, causing controversy with yeah. his comments on TV. <clears> but best, but, there is but something this is about French football, not just the national trying. team as well. But yeah, it's true that French football players aren't always the most popular people in the public consciousness. And that surely feeds into this debate. I mean, Dan was saying it's ingrained into the national collective consciousness. It's, it's true. And, and, and yeah. the French now have a, also a, this overall pervasive impression that, football, that footballers in general are a bunch of spoiled brats. Yeah, the governance of football is you know quite good in France we we have a overhead uh, organization that is looking like how the the government is well, made yeah well uh, uh, that's not exist in England but the image of, of the of the football is not good I think it's a question also of culture when you when you go to to England to United Kingdom um, from the pub to the uh, to the match you know to the to the stadium, there is, there is you know a, a strong identification uh, <laughs> uh, to the yeah. This is what I'm doing too. But, well, <laughs> a, a strong identification with, with the with, with the fans, the basis of fans. Well, it's not a real French phenomenon. No. But there's something else. I, I forget which year that was, you know, when Zidane had headbutted uh, the Italian and basically lost the World Cup for the French. And he was 
forgiven immediately. Which, he by was, the way, earned him a statue in Qatar, just found out. It was outside statue. the Centre Pompidou a few, a yes, few months Yes, I mean, which, and that statue was taken down in Qatar just this week. You know, yeah. uh, the guy insulted him. Of course, he was trying to get a rise out of him, and he, they got the championship <laughs> out of it, the, the World Cup out of it. So wonderful, you know, well done. And, and he should have lost all his endorsements and all his contracts, but instead of which, he was allowed to apologize after a deal with his agent on what he, the, the journalists was allowed to ask for, you know, the questions they were allowed to ask, and he explained that he was horribly insulted. And the, the, the message that was being sent to French youth who admired him because he's a great football player was, uh, if somebody insults you, hit them. And I think that if you allow this, then what happened in South Africa was the direct consequence of the Zidane's, uh, Zidane's uh, tantrum and the fact that nobody ever dared to tell him that he was wrong. So again, the problem is the, 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 the Gallic personality. I think, yes, I think it's, I mean, I'm, I will agree that in, in of terms of football players, today. and very much unlike rugby players, uh, are, uh, they are spoiled brats. I think, um, you know, the, the thing is as well is that in, for example, in England, um, you know, players earn huge amounts of money. Um, but it's easier for the clubs to absorb that because they can count on greater revenues from their TV deals and from their match day revenue. So it becomes less of an issue. Here in France, it's a much more acute problem because French clubs really are genuinely struggling. And, you know, that, that probably is why it's so much of an issue. You know, we've seen Paris Saint-Germain, you know, all, it was a unanimous vote, this strike. But Paris Saint-Germain don't really have to worry about it. Obviously, it's not in their interests, but it's not really a problem for them. Same for Monaco, it doesn't affect them at all in theory, although that, that could change. But uh, the point is that, you know, they voted along with this in terms of solidarity. But it, you know, and even the clubs from Ligue 2, who don't, who don't pay anybody more than a million euros, you know, many of the clubs in Ligue 1 don't, they still know that this is a problem for French football in general because, you know, for a, I hate to call it a product, but it is a product, for a product to remain um, appealing to spectators, it needs to retain competitiveness. There needs to be competitiveness. And you do lose that if the middle class clubs, as, uh, as Pascal has put it, uh, you know, having to pay a great amount of money for the players they've had previously <laughs> when clubs like Paris Saint-Germain can just, you know, bring in whoever they like. Erwin Lenoir, you're a, a tax lawyer, you're a business consultant. Uh, let's just assume you're hired by uh, Saint-Étienne, Pascal's favorite club. One of those, uh, they belong to the middle class of French football, as Pascal has been explaining. Uh, so they don't have elite players. They're not an elite club. Uh, they, have a, they have a strong they have fan base. Players, yeah. I'm so, okay, I apologize. <laughs> <about that. laughs> Sorry, I hit a nerve there. I hit a nerve. <laughs> Uh, anyway, they say they're typically the kind of club that they're that there's going to have to pay millions of euros in uh, in, in tax revenues potentially. What would you uh, advise them to do? Would you say keep your star players, pay the tax? Uh, excuse me. In fact, let me just ask you that question: Are they going to have to pay? Do they have players? Yeah, they will have to pay euros? before Christmas. Okay, they will have to pay. So, what would you advise them to do? Do you say get rid of your one or two star players, or well, it, <coughs> they have? They've already had to do that. Sorry to yeah. jump in, but they, yeah, they let go. You know, Pierre Emerick Aubameyang, who's gone to Borussia Dortmund, you know, for I think uh, quite a cut down price because they needed the money, and that yeah. happens in French football all the time. It's already been happening for several years uh, because they can't compete with the kind of money generated by clubs in England, in Germany, in Spain, and in Italy. French football is generally seen as the French league, generally <coughs> seen as the fifth, you know, in, in Europe. So, sorry. So the football, French football clubs are going to be nursery for good, good hunters yeah. in Europe for good players, you know, for. All they go to PSG that can, that can and Monaco. Afford, you know, uh, springboards for, for yeah, other better right. leagues. Right. Feeder ones. What I would tell them is, first, you will have to pay taxes, so try to cut, cut the cost. Any, anything you can cut, cut it. And then, as you will have to pay and you won't have the choice, try communication. Go, go on strike. And that's what they're doing. Because, you know, wh why are they go go um, going on strike and at the end of the November? It's because they don't have any other, other possibility. They cannot leave the country. It's impossible. That's they true. cannot uh, cut the cost that much. So what they, what they have is the communication bat battle. And that's uh, what they're doing I, right now. Can I play devil's advocate and suggest that maybe they could spend the money they already have better or they could you know be run more efficiently they could market themselves better they could market the league that's better. right sure you know, that's uh, the point they, they could involve well the match day revenue and marketing revenues this is but what they the will have to do but fans always end up do often end up anyway paying footing the bill obviously companies who invest in the clubs do as well but you know there's inelastic demand in football fans will always support their team 
more or less, and will pay meaning money they to will watch. Buy the tickets, yeah. come meaning what they will buy the tickets, come on. Even if the price goes up, they still want to see their team because they can't choose another product. They can't change team. They can't say, you know, I'm going to support someone else who's. who's tickets are cheaper but what they can do is now because so much of the revenue that comes into football is dependent on money from abroad and we saw the difference in tv revenue that comes from abroad between france and england is that a football fan who is watching perhaps the indian league or a tv uh, sorry in india watching french football you know and a tv company who's bought the rights to the indian league might say the english the french league rather in india might say do you know what actually this put nobody wants to watch this so we should change or the fans might say this league's not interesting so we should watch another one you know, people abroad, they're not going to watch their local club. They're watching it on TV now. There are many loyal fans abroad who are absolutely loyal to their club. But the point is that, you know, new fans are springing up all the time, all around the world. We see clubs going on pre-season tours to Asia constantly now to, to America to grow their revenue streams. And, you know, fans will fall in love with the teams that reach out to them most and the teams that are already big and the teams that have star players. And France is not one of those leagues, really, and apart so far, from PSG. Fans, global fans and fans in India and around the world have not fallen in love with, uh, with Saint-Étienne. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm sorry, Pascal. Thank you yeah. to all our guests this evening for joining the France 24 debate. Remember, you can watch us on the website, france24.com. Thanks a lot. Stay tuned.